I am truly delighted to be here. It's 49 years since I sat where you're sitting now. <laughs> My final year before entering the ministry. 1967-68 was my year of study here, which I really, really enjoyed. It's a blessing to me in many ways. Uh, the greatest blessing was one man, uh, most of you may not know much of him, Clark Copeland. Mm -hmm. Clark Copeland was a teacher and a pastor. He just blew my mind in the Old Testament. He opened it in a way that I'd never thought of before, and he fed me so richly. And my father died when I was away, and I came back in the plane after his funeral. I thought my friends would be waiting at the airport, but Clark <coughs> Copeland was waiting for me. He took me to his home, and he says, Ted, I'm exactly the same age as your father, and if ever you want any help in your life, just let me know, and I'll give it to you. And he showed it to me again and again. And I'm glad that we still have men like this in the seminary here. Men who teach and men who, who are pastors. Who can instruct you and whom you can go to for help. That's what we want in our Reformed Presbyterian seminaries. seminaries. I have no time for preparation for this. I was asked just the other day. <laughs> but I've been lecturing to my own students on ap applicatory preaching bringing the Word of God home to the hearts of those who are listening. And I thought I would take a bit of my most recent lecture and give it to you. So I'm sorry there's nothing more special about it. Uh, we've been looking at various things with my students in, in application. Uh, and particularly, we've been, we've been thinking of the mindset, of the message, of the method, and then finally of the man. And I'm thinking with the students of the man, what can be expected of the man who is preaching. One good verse would be 1 Timothy 4.16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Keep a close watch on yourself and your preaching. What particular things can we look at in ourselves, want to improve, want to be blessed, want to be guided. Let me suggest some several to you. The first thing I would suggest that we should work for as pastors and preachers is self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness. What cripples many people is too much self-consciousness thinking about themselves, pondering about themselves, and it comes in many ways. Some people are proud and self-important. Some are the opposite. They're very insecure. They're hungry for praise. They're hypersensitive if they're criticized. Some are perfectionists, stressed and guilty, because they're not reaching some height. Some are discouraged, and they always feel worthless. Some are intimidated by the people listening to them, by the occasion they're in. These things all look very different, but they all come from the same root, to be too aware of ourselves. And it's wrong when we do that. It puffs us up, it cripples us, it weighs us down. And we want to think about dealing with this. And there is one clear, simple way of handling it. And it is simply this. Forget yourself. <laughs> Forget yourself. And I'm going to suggest that we can do this in two different ways. First of all, Focus on the truth that you're preaching. Focus on the truth that you're preaching. You're telling people about the Lord and all his grace. You're speaking to people who are in great, great needs, and you want to understand that 
and know that. You're making clear to them the whole rich, wonderful gospel in all its glory and majesty. Lose yourself in these huge realities. Who are you? What do you matter? But Thomas, Ch Thomas Chalmers spoke of it as expulsive power. It drives yourself out of yourself. Think of a musician who's playing a great piece. I was speaking to a young girl the other day, and she'd been having a duet with a friend, and she was talking to me about the beautiful piece they were playing together, and she just was, was lost in it, captured. She forgot about herself whether she was playing properly or not, whether she was meeting all the notes. No, the music, the music captured her. And that's what we're to do, to forget about ourselves. There's another way in which you can forget about yourself. It's an unusual way to self-forgetting. It may sound contradictory. Please be patient with me. Face yourself as you really are in the light of Christ. Face yourself as you really are in the light of Christ. That is liberating. It has happened to me and to many of us. God took me down. God made me look at myself fully and honestly. And to see my corruption and my littleness, and my foolishness, and my wrongness. And at the same time, to see that I had been chosen in eternity, and that I had been called by God to this office. Able to understand 1 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, where Paul says with me, it is a small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. It is the Lord who judges me. We're not being arrogant. It's the reverse. We can each say, I'm not worth defending. I know who I am. I know what I'm like. I know the wrong things I've done. I'm not worth defending. It's not dismissive. But we can say to someone in our minds, not out loud, although I like your praise, I don't need your praise. I don't need your praise. And while I don't ignore your criticism, I'm not shattered by it. Because, friends, two things I know. I am far worse than anyone on earth can realize. In myself, I am far, far worse than any critic could ever say. And at the same time, I am far more deeply loved and accepted than I can begin to comprehend. And friends, that sets you free to see what matters. It's a paradox. It's only then that you can be yourself more attractively for, than ever. That's who children are, little children. They're themselves. They're not acting. They're not being anybody. You look at them and you see the real person. One writer put it this way, self is not a Venetian blind in the way of the gospel. So that our self is hiding the gospel and we open the blind and the gospel shines in. No, he says, self is a stained glass window through which the gospel shines with something of your color in it. Each one of us is a special 
stained glass window created by God. And God shines his truth through you and through me. And it's got some different shades in each of us, some different colors. That's God's will. That's God's purpose. The Scottish writer J.S. Stewart says, It is always thus in every age. Ministers of the living Christ are made by crushing, paralyzing sense of abject worthlessness. And then the man rising to his full stature as God's commissioned messenger. Look at yourself. You're so low and you're so high by God and you're called to preach God's word. But let's think, secondly, for godliness. Godliness. This is a beautiful parallel with self-forgetfulness. You remember the verse quoted, 1 Timothy 4.16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your preaching. In that order, in that order, look to yourself, search yourself, watch yourself, bring yourself before God before you get to the teaching. It's you that's important before you begin the teaching. Ezra puts it this way in Ezra 7.10. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. To study the word and to obey the word and then to teach it. That's the order we're called to, our godliness. Friends, it's vital. It's, there's a frequent danger of the hypocrisy of inner disobedience. The man who Jesus says on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. We've got to watch ourselves. Are we with Christ? Are we walking with Christ? Are we obeying God? We've got to keep struggling with this, our godliness. We all have character flaws. We all have inconsistencies which can contradict the message and make our people stumble. Paul says in Romans 2, 21, you who teach others, do you not teach yourself? The name of God is blasphemed through you. Do you not teach yourself? Did you teach yourself this morning? Will you teach yourself before the day ends? Or will you be giving yourself to learning what you'll use to teach others? Teach yourself. We can be damaged by an inner disengagement from truth. Coolness, failure to apply to ourselves the truth we press on others. Richard Baxter, what is the title of his book? The Reformed Pastor. The Reformed Pastor. Great, great book. I read it every three or four years. Been reading it for nearly 50 years. Lovely book. Pastor says, Baxter says, preach to yourselves first before you preach to the people. And with greater zeal, nothing does more to make you good preachers than that which does most to make you good Christians. Oh, what a heinous thing it is in us to study how to disgrace sin, to make it as odious in the eyes of our people as we can. And when we have done, to live it and to secretly cherish that which we publicly disgrace. There's much more than we could say, but we too often overlook how our preaching is damaged 
by our inner failures and sins. And the converse is true. There's a strange, compelling power of godliness. Baxter again. When your minds are in a holy, heavenly frame, your people are likely to partake of the fruits of it. They will likely feel when you have been much with God. And men and women, that explains the effectiveness of some. Some we could call one-talent ministers, people who are not at the top of the exams, people who don't get the prizes, people who haven't got extreme intellectual ability, but godly, earnest, serious people. And you see them, and God uses them, and God blesses them. Holiness of life convinces. We've looked at godliness. Before that, at self-forgetfulness. And thirdly and briefly, let me say a few words about tenderness. Tenderness. Under the good shepherd, we are shepherds to our people. Some people, some preachers rather, are hard, authoritarian. They're bullies. They attract spiritual masochists. But bruised, battered people turn away from them. They're too harsh and they're too hard. I love t- 2 Timothy 4 2. Reprove. Rebuke, exhort, strong, rather frightening words with complete patience. Or rather, long-suffering, macrothemia. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience. We need to be patient. We need to be gentle in bringing an unwelcome word to a difficult people. Complete patience. Passy. All patience. Nothing else but patience. Calvin says, severity must be seasoned with gentleness that it may be known to spring from a peaceful heart. Severity must be seasoned with gentleness. Patrick Fairburn writes in the 19th century, All faithful ministers must know how to reprove and admonish, but of importance for the success of their mission, that when these severer methods have to be exhorted to. All should be done in a gentle, patient spirit. He says, the more anyone can carry on his ministerial work in such a spirit, the more is conviction likely to take hold of his hearers. Some of you may have children. When did you last smack your child? How did you do it? How did you do it? When you reached out to take your child and to smack them. And inside yourself you were crying. Perhaps you'd cry tears in your ears. I love this little child. And I'm only smacking them because it's good for them. Because they need it. We do it, yes, we do it, but we do it so gently (coughs) and so lovingly. And friends, that is how we're to smack our people. Baxter says, if ministers were content to show interest in the affections of their people, they might do more. Here's a 
closing sentence. When people see that you unfeignedly love them, they will hear anything and bear anything from you with complete patience and suffering. Earlier in the letter, 2 Timothy 2.24, Paul writes, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of truth. Tenderness. Thank you. We'll conclude singing Psalm 119E. Please uh, introduce yourself to Pastor Donnelly at the end of the service. Pastor Donnelly, thank you for bringing us the word today. 119E, let's stand.